Hello everybody and welcome back to your least favorite YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about stream processing. And When I say stream processing, I certainly don't mean taking a leak. What I'm talking about is real-time event processing. So this subject has a lot of content in it and so I've split it into four hopefully relatively small videos, partially so that I can cover them more in depth and partially because I'm lazy and don't want to make longer ones. So let's go ahead and get into it. Alright, so for the uneducated, what exactly is stream processing? Well, the gist is so far in terms of passing information around our application, we've really only spoken about this through using a database. We've got one client or one application server writing to a database and then down the line another will read from it. However, what if we want to be able to react to things in real time as they happen? Wouldn't it be great if one piece of our application could pass something like an event in real time to another and it could react? Well, that's what stream processing is. So stream processing, the general framework, is that we've got some piece of our system called a producer. It is generating events which are somehow passed over to a consumer. So obviously there's a lot of different ways that we can do this, but let's start talking about how we could. So typically what we will do is use an event or message broker. So not always is this the case, actually oftentimes, or not necessarily often, but infrequently what you'll see are actually direct TCP connections between our producers and consumers. Certain designs do warrant this or it makes sense to actually just directly connect between those two systems and pass messages from one to another. The issue with that, however, is if you have many producers and many different consumers all listening and producing the same types of messages, now all of a sudden you're maintaining O of n squared number of connections, and frankly that's a lot of load on these systems that, generally speaking, are probably going to be doing some other type of processing, and we'd rather not bog them down. Typically, instead what we'll use is a dedicated system known as a broker, which sits in the middle of our producers and consumers. And so this way, as opposed to having O of n squared connections, we can actually maintain a linear number of connections because kind of the, the brunt of the work maintaining them is actually done by the broker itself. And the broker's main job is to pass those messages from producer to consumer. And depending what type of broker you use, there's obviously going to be some additional functionality. But for the sake of this video, I'm actually not going to dive too deep into the architecture of a message broker. There are multiple different implementations of these, but right now what I'm going to ask you to do is think of this thing as a black box that simply passes messages from the producer to the consumer. And then we're going to talk about certain applications of stream processing and why we would use it in the first place. So, what are our main reasons for actually using stream processing? Well, I can think of three of them, and these are the three that I'm going to touch upon in order to introduce the subject in this video. The first is grouping and bucketing of events, oftentimes by like a timestamp uh, or a time window or a trailing time window. We'll see how we do that in a second. Another is something known as change data capture, and then a third is known as event sourcing. Two and three do seem relatively similar, but I'll explain the nuance in a little bit. So let's take a look at time windowing certain events or metrics or anything like that so that we can talk about them a little bit more. So imagine that we've got ourselves a producer over here. This could be something like a sensor or an application server that produces logs. And of course those messages are now being sent right over here to the broker which then forwards them to our consumer. Now imagine that what we've got below is effectively just a view of the state of our consumer, which again is doing all the processing of these messages. So let's imagine that we wanted to bucket them into something called tumbling windows. So a tumbling window, as you can see, are non-overlapping windows that start at a fixed interval with a fixed time size. So in this case, what we're looking at here are one minute tumbling windows starting at the beginning of every single minute. So how would we actually deal with this? Well, every single event is going to have a timestamp. From the timestamp, we can extract the minute. And then we can bucket them in our bucket. We could probably use a hash map on this to perform this well. And then our hash map would probably have some sort of list of elements where all of the elements are the messages themselves. So that is known as a tumbling window. Another common task is where we actually create a hopping window, where hopping windows can actually overlap with one another. So for example, here is one 
five minute hopping window from 12 o'clock to 12.04, but then 12.01 to 12.05 is a different hopping window, and 12.02 to 12.06 is a different five minute hopping window. So how can we actually go ahead and get all of the events that are in these? Well, if you notice, every single five minute hopping window is composed of five non-overlapping tumbling windows. So we can effectively do the same thing we did before, group all of our messages into tumbling windows, and then when we need a given five minute hopping window, we can just aggregate the five tumbling windows that make them up. So in the case of 12 o'clock to 12.04, this guy over here, we're taking the 12 o'clock, we're taking the 12.01, we're taking the 12.02, the 12.03, and the 12.04. And so we would have events E, H, C, D, I, and G. And then the last type of task that we'll often see in terms of just like doing timing on events is known as the sliding window, where effectively, you know, we just want, let's say, the last five minutes of events. So what we would use here is an in-memory queue or an in-memory linked list. And basically, as events come in, you know, we're adding them to the back of our queue. And then we have a separate thread that's saying, oh, shoot, it's 12.07 now. 12.01 is no longer valid. Let's remove that from our linked list. And now just this is going to be our last five minutes of data. So hopefully that makes sense a little bit. Not overly important, but it is one common use case of stream processing. Let's look at another called change data capture. Now this is something I use very frequently in a lot of the systems design mock interviews, so it's important that we understand what this really means. Basically the gist is a lot of times we're gonna be writing to a database, right? We've got our client here, we've got our database, and from there, we've got a second piece of storage that we basically want to keep in line with our database, right? We've got some other piece of derived data. So in this case, the derived data would be our search index. You don't really have to worry too much about what a search index is for now. I'll cover this in a later video. But the gist is, when we have a write that goes to the database, we also want that write to be reflected in our search index. So as you can see, We've got one write from the database, it's going into our message broker, and then the message broker is of course going to forward that to our search index so that our search index can be updated. So change data capture is really, really useful for allowing us to keep our derived data in sync with our main database, which tends to be our source of truth. This is good because it allows us avoiding things like two-phase commit, which is very expensive, whereas you, know, you wouldn't want to do a two-phase commit between our search index and our database. It's a lot easier to just use a message broker. Okay, another type of thing is event sourcing, which at first is going to seem very, very similar to change data capture, but there is some nuance here. So instead of actually writing directly to your database in this case, what you're gonna do is you're gonna send all of these guys right here, which are known as events, directly to a message broker. The message broker is then going to forward those to a consumer, and then finally those messages are going to get to a database where they can be properly written. So what's the advantage of throwing everything in the broker first? Well, notice that I called these events and not writes. The reason they're called events is because they use database agnostic language. As you can see, the type of things that we're doing here are things like me clicking the cart or me changing the quantity of an item in my cart. The reason for this is that in change data capture, the thing that's actually going into the broker is not database agnostic. This is specific to the database. And so when we have database agnostic events that are going into our broker, basically meaning that you know they're not actually specific to what database we use or what the state of the database was at the time, it means that let's say 20 years in the future, I want to use a new database. I can actually just go ahead and read from that broker and translate those events however I see fit. I don't need to rely on this data model. This data model could be outdated. And if we don't care about it, or for whatever reason it's no longer working for us, it's no longer useful for us, it's a lot more useful to have all of those raw events that would be in the broker. So the main issue here, of course, is that does assume that the broker is actually holding on to events, which it very well may not be. Again, that is one of the subjects of next video. Do we actually keep these events? Do we throw them out? What goes on? It depends really on what type of event broker that you're using. So the last topic that I want to cover in this video is exactly once message processing or event processing. So processing a message exactly once means two things. It means that first of all, you're gonna process that message at least once. 
How do we know that we can process it at least once? Well, we need a few guarantees about our message broker. For starters, it has to be fault tolerant. And typically when I say something is fault tolerant, what I really mean is that there's some sort of like write ahead log, so you make sure that everything that goes in there is on disk in the event that your computer just shuts down. So that is going to be some disk persistence and also replication, because if I come and I smash that computer with a hammer, you having those writes on disk is probably not gonna help you very much. You probably need a second instance of that message broker that also has access to the message. Another important thing here is consumer acknowledgements. How is it that I know that a message has been processed at least once unless the consumer reports back to me on the message broker that it has processed it? That is very important. Consumer acknowledgements are something that you'll typically see in just about every single message broker. On the other hand, we also need to be sure that we don't process these messages more than once. So there are basically two ways that we can do that. The first is two-phase commit. Now if you know, Every single time we talk about two-phase commit in this channel, generally speaking, it's bad. We want to avoid it wherever possible. But in this case, what would that look like? Well, just quickly zooming in, we would have a coordinator node, which at the same time reaches out both to the consumer, right over here, and the broker. It says to the broker, hey, can you delete this message? Are you good to do that? Will it break anything if you delete it? The broker will probably say, yes, I'm fine doing that. And then it'll also say to the consumer, hey, are you able to handle this message? And if so, are you ready to commit it? Now, if both of these systems say yes, then the coordinator can reach back out to them and say, go ahead and actually commit that. You're good to go. Of course, two-phase commit always very slow and we avoid it when possible, which is why the other nice thing that we can possibly do is make our message broker item potent. Or not necessarily our message broker, but the combination of our message broker and our consumer. So what item potence means is if we were to process the message more than once, it's the same thing as processing once. There are no side effects to passing the message to the consumer multiple times. So what's an easy way of doing this? Well, basically every single message on the broker gets assigned a unique key. And when the consumer sees a message with said key, it can just respond saying whether or not it's seen the key before. And if that message comes back again, it'll see the key one more time and then respond accordingly, saying, I've seen this, I'm not going to process it again. Of course, this does make a key assumption about how we're doing our partitioning or our consumption of messages in the sense that we are assuming that the same consumer is seeing the same message every single time. If it's possible that I can have two different consumers read the same message from a message broker, then we're in trouble because one of the consumers may have already seen it and stored that item potency key but on the other hand, the other consumer wouldn't have seen that key before, and then we're in trouble, we've just processed the message twice. So again, that is something to think about in terms of how you're laying out which consumers are getting which message. Anyways guys, hope this serves as a good introduction. Sorry I've treated the message broker as a black box thus far, but the whole reason for that is we're going to spend the entirety of next video figuring out what's actually going on inside there and tearing up that box, as they say. So anyway, I will see you in the next one.